As I was worshipping, I was holding my youngest. <laughs> I forget that he's six now and not two. So my, <laughs> so my arms sort of seized up and sort of shivering, you know, when your muscles are sort of hurting. So I thought if you see me sort of like wobble, it's just because of that. I, uh, I need to sort of remember that he's not a baby anymore. But yeah, it's, it's, it's great to be here. And um, as we've been saying, for those who may be visiting today or have not been here for a while, we're sort of continuing on. In fact, we're com- coming to an end of our uh, study on Isaiah 61. And we've been going through uh, what Jesus' ministry is. As we will see later, as Jesus took what was said in Isaiah and he spoke it forth in, in Luke chapter 4. And he kind of claimed this as his own. When he talks about setting captives free, the anointing of the Holy Spirit has come upon me to preach good news to the poor, to the brokenhearted, and as we come to this one now, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release those from darkness for the prisoners. So that's we've gone through the first couple throughout the last few weeks, what it means to be proclaiming the news to the poor, to the brokenhearted, and this last one we're coming to now is, as we said, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release some of the darkness for the prisoners. So it's a really great topic, I think, to end it with. And I want to sort of end it on a high and end it on a, a bit of homework for everyone today. So I hope we can sort of take something away with us today. As always, when we do uh, sermons, it's always, I think anyone who does a sermon, it's always their intention that we can kind of wrestle with something. We want foods. We don't want milk. We want something that we can take home and chew on. So I hope that as you we go through this today that you will sort of find some some meat on the bone Uh, and rather being than a measly KFC little drumstick you'll be a leg of lamb that you can literally delve into as we go a bit later today so there's three things I also want to focus on a bit today um, as we go through it who are the captives that's number one what keeps people captive and what freedom do the captives receive and then the last bit will be what is our response to this so Isaiah was writing this as a prophecy of what the Messiah would be and what he would do his ministry. And as we've briefly explained, Jesus in Luke chapter 4, when he comes into the temple and he describes what his ministry is going to be. He says, I have come to preach the good news to the poor, to the brokenhearted, and to set captives free. This is the mission and the ministry of Jesus. And we should understand it fully as we come to think, where do we play, what part do we play in the ministry of Jesus? And what can we do as a result of it? When I think of the word captive, it's a bit of an, uh, an old word, I guess, in some sort of way. Um, so I did what most like, young people do when they sort of, you know, want to find out what something meant. So I Googled it. And uh, it, what did I say? I did write it down in my notes. Well, I've forgotten it. Basically, it kind of, it's, it's, it's basically synonymous with being a prisoner to something or to someone. Being captive is being kept as a prisoner to somebody or someone, something that you're under their control and you can't release yourself from it. So in that way, the whole idea of captives and prisoners kind of go hand in hand with each other. But it's a bit of an odd word because when we think about captives, we, don't, we tend to think of captives of war. You know, when people were prisoners of war during World War II or whatever it might have been. That's what kind of captive means. So what does it mean in the Bible and how can it relate to the people of God? Well, you can go back through the story of the Old Testament and the best example I can kind of think about was when when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, out of their captivity. For hundreds of years, they were slaves to the Egyptians, oppressed, marginalised, put down in so many other different ways until finally... Moses, well, God rather led them to their, out of their captivity. And obviously the whole new story begins straight after that. But these were marginalised people in their society, finding things difficult, being oppressed, struggling to live life the way they wish they could. And then we could jump through to the New Testament where James where he describes what religion really is. And in fact, he says, he starts off the first chapter, James, as he kind of describes that it's great to be coming up in today's sort of context. I'm sort of paraphrasing, so don't take, me by your, <laughs> don't take my word for this, it's word for word. But he's basically saying, you, know, you can come to church, you can come and get to know God, you can hear with your ears, you can read about God in different theology books in different ways. But unless your theology, unless your knowledge impacts your actions, then it's worthless. 
Christianity is not meant to be an intellectual exercise, but rather something that is internal, that births something forward, that changes our actions. That when we become to know God at first, if you're a Christian here today, you might remember the first time you got to know God. And at first your whole life was changed inwardly, but then it's meant to then go forward and express itself outwardly. How does it interact with other people? What use is your Christianity if it's just an internal thing, but doesn't impact your conduct and your words? In fact, James goes on and describes the tongue as a vicious thing and we need to use it properly when we talk to people and the way we conduct ourselves. So Christianity has to infiltrate all the areas of what we do in our day-to-day activity and lives. And then he ends with this. He says, <clears throat> after describing the importance of not just being hearers but doers of the word, he says this, religion that God the Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. So if you wanted a question, you want to know the answer, this is the answer. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted of the world. To look after people, to put into practice, not like a one-off thing, but to keep on doing it. To keep on being intentional in our actions, in our words when we go and see people and looking out for those who are most marginalised in our society. For a period of time last year, I, I worked as an Afghan refugee support worker. And I, I worked with different families who have been through horrific things in Afghanistan. You know, I would, I would often go for days out with, with the, what used to be usually with the dads. That's the way sort of culturally it works. Um, they were large families as well, between seven and nine people in, per household. And the dads would tell me stories about how they escaped Afghanistan. Some of them had bruises still and pain on their shoulder where they were being battered by guns as they were trying to escape. One person, bless him, I remember him saying to me that as he was going out there, he almost got stopped from coming back to England. And the only way he could have got back is if he had this email and his, on his phone died a battery. And he had no way of showing them this email that he was actually had the right to come back to the UK. And he was waiting in a queue with his wife and his two kids, hoping that somebody of the other refugees that were going through would have a charger for him, that he could actually charge his phone and briefly show the person to give him the ability to come back. And luckily, it happened, and he did. And he managed to quickly charge his phone, show it, and then he came back to, he came to the UK and settled in the UK. And these people are like the most marginalised, I guess, one of the most marginalised in our society, People who find out are fleeing from war and conflict. And what does Christianity have to offer and have to say as a result? And what does the church have to do as a result? Where do we stand? Do we stand idly by and just and as these people come and just have nothing to do with it? Or do we actually get involved and think, you know what? What would Jesus do be doing in these situations? What is Jesus' heart for these people? Or to translate it another way, we can talk about the different ways people or other marginalised people in our society. Those who are vulnerable, whether it's the elderly or whether it's people who are going through tough times, whether it's drug addiction or the ones who are just literally on their last legs. Are these the captives that we're talking about? Are these the people who are most struggling and oppressed in society? As a church, we get involved with food bank, giving out food, acting on our will to serve people. James calls us, like I say, not to be hearers of the word, but to do it. And so often, as I was thinking to myself, and I was trying to apply it to myself, I was like, you know what? All too often, I'm very good at hearing what God has to say. In fact, you know, I'm a bit of a, a, bit of a geek, I, I guess, if you like. like. I love reading. I love studying. I will, I will just read and read and read. And that'd be fine by me. But, you know, when it comes to putting into action, it's a whole different thing, isn't it? Like, I'm absolutely rubbish at um, DIY. And my wife kind of uh, sadly found this out after she had married me. And, uh, you know, <laughs> we do... Yeah, it's a bit of... <laughs> sorry about that. But it was, you know, one of those things where you wish you can follow instructions. You can know certain amounts of knowledge, can't you? Uh, I mean, I don't really... I still get, like, you know... Ask me what Phillips or screwdriver or the star, or whatever, it's just in one ear and out the other. You know, until, until once eventually my wife was like, Oh, I got myself a present today. And I was, Oh, what's that, honey? He's, oh, it's a screwdriver. I was like, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll definitely support you there. You go ahead. 
So if you want anything doing, just call my wife because she's way better at doing it than me. Anyway, I don't want to digress. You know, I could read something about the instructions of how to do something. I could have an in, you know, I could have a knowledge of something, but unless I actually put into practice and build something, unless I was doing through the instructions, those terrible instructions for IKEA, where I could maybe know what all the things are, but unless I actually get it, it would be useless if someone then took everything away from me and said, okay, Jack, just set it up, and I didn't know how to do it. Or I didn't set it up at all. I was just like, yeah, I know how to make a wardrobe, but actually I haven't done one before. <laughs> the, the principle still applies. And sometimes, you know, I would say as Christians, or if you're a Christian today, or as myself, I, really, I always preach to myself when I preach just to anybody else, here, any, wherever I go. You know, I'm very good. We're very good at having head knowledge of the Bible or of God, our experiences. But how much can we say that it, it takes forth and takes action in the way that we treat others? Maybe that's a challenge we need to think today. How can we serve how can we look out? How can we be Jesus to the vulnerable in our society, in our world? God hates injustice. And that's why, as we've been saying, he goes forth in all the ways to actually... God is a God of justice. And sometimes things seem really struggle and things seem really hard in life. But yet God is, still, is always present, never failing to be there for us. I once watched a... Uh, a debate between a, a professor and a, a, a university professor and a Christian apologist, a person defending the Christian faith. Uh, this, so this is, this is a true story. This is what I'm making up. Um, and they take turns, if you ever watch a debate, um, they take turns in defending their position. Oh, I believe Christianity is true because of X, and then I believe atheism is true because of Y, and they come together. And there's this question at this point of tension between the debate where the... Uh, the professor came across and he said to, him, he said to the uh, apologist, he's like, I am, yeah, but one of the things that gets me about Christianity is that if you look at all the things that, all the bad things that I've done in the name of God, how can you say that your God is a God of justice and peace when you look at what people have done? And you could tell all of the people came to a hush. And as I was watching, I was like, oh, great, I can't wait to kind of hear his response to it. And his response was really great. And I tried to sort of jot it down on my laptop, but I've kind of got the gist of what he was saying. But I think it's really pertinent to us today as Christians as we can face these questions. How can we believe in a God when there is injustice? And how can we see where sometimes the church hasn't acted correctly and properly? And this Christian apologist comes up and is full of confidence. And he says, you're quite right. There are people who are calling themselves Christians who have done not good things. But, you know, I don't come to defend people. I come to defend the Bible. I come to defend Christianity. We are fallen as human beings. There are Christians who haven't done necessarily great things. But we don't come to defend their actions. We can say, what does the Bible say? What does Jesus have to say? And he comes with this great quote. This historian um, of, of history says this. And it's really profound. It says, we have much to say about the collective impact of Christianity upon mankind as a whole. Here has been the most potent force that mankind has ever known. Much owes themselves to Christianity. And he lists the emergence of schools, the emergence, the emergence of types of education, democracy within the large part of the 19th and 20th century owes itself largely to the teaching of Christianity. The abolition of slavery was chiefly due to the teaching of Christianity. The support given to those who suffered war and for the abolition of war owe their inception to the Christian faith. The elevation of the status of women owes its in an incalculable debt to Christianity. No, and he ends with this, no single force in history has been so widely potent for the relief of suffering brought on by famine, and also the creation, and also who create, have created hospitals and orphanages than the Christian faith. I would love to repeat it. I should have had it on the screen, but I was, I was, it was a quick last minute dash into the sermon today that I had to do this. But what an amazing list of things. You know what? So much good in the world owes itself to the Christian faith to hospitals, to orphanages, the abolition of slavery, the elevation of women, 
God, our God, is a God who is passionate about his people and about his world. And you know what? That's what sets Christianity apart from so many other religions. You know, if you talk to somebody who's not too sure about what Christianity has to offer in terms of other religions, and they say, yeah, but most religions want the best things for people. But you know what? Christianity is far different, apart from the fact that it's the correct one. (laughs) But Christianity is far, far different. Christianity searches the depths of the heart and actually says, no, God doesn't just wind up a clock of the world and it just ticks over. God actually gets involved in the day-to-day living of his creation and of his people, and he loves them, and he is passionate for them. The Bible is full of anthropomorphic language, and what I mean by that is language that is used of is expressing a human emotion of God, like anger and, and fear, but it's also full of so many other amazing qualities that you wouldn't imagine of God having, full of emotions of loving and being a jealous God, jealous in the sense that he's jealous for his people. There's, he just talks about having eyes that are on those who serve him, eyes that are on those who he loves and wants to bring into his presence. Our God is a loving an interactive God. But you know what? He interacts in many different ways. And one of the crazy and insane ways God uses to love his people is by using his people to love people. And isn't that one of the most amazing things? And isn't that a big responsibility when you think about it? One of the ways, the best ways God loves people is that he uses his people to love people so that he, they would see him, they would know him. Our God is a God of justice. Our God searches the depths of people's hearts, knows what's going on in people's lives. It's not detached from what is going on in your life right now. And cares deeply about you. And cares deeply about those who are suffering the hardest in this world. Well, that we could be, we could stop at that, at a sense. <clears throat> It'd be a very short sermon, but maybe a hard, okay, sort of to get the point across. And you may be a, 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 a non, you may not believe in Christianity this morning. You may be on the fence. You may be not quite sure what you believe. And you may think, you know what, Jack? That's a great message. I'll get, I'll, I'll get on board with that to some degree. You know, your God is a God who sets captives free, who sets the people who are oppressed, who are suffering, free. I'll get on board with that. But the problem with that is that's not all Jesus has to say. And that's only half the story. Because the captives, when we look in the Bible and we try to understand it deeper, are not just people who are oppressed and suffering in this world, although obviously they are. It reaches far greater. In fact, it reaches to you. We are all captives. And there's a great bit (coughs) in... um, John, in the book of John, where it describes it, John 8, oh, I've, I did have it and I've lost it now. Hang on two seconds. In John chapter 8, this really comes to the fore and it's really, really interesting when we try and understand this. Because you might think, you know, Jack, that's great, but you know, I'm not a captive. I'm not a captive to anything. So, you know, it doesn't really relate to me. And, you know, that's a very valid thing to say, isn't it? Because you're not a cat. We live in a free country. We can do what we want. We can do what we please to some degree. We're not bound by so many things as other people. So in a certain degree, we exercise a relatively good amount of freedom compared to other places in the world. So, yes, you might think, I am not, fr- I am not bound by anything. And we go to John chapter 8, and it's really interesting. John chapter 8 first starts off with, what, Jesus talking to a woman who had committed adultery and they were ready to stone her. And, he go, and you might know the story, and I won't spend too long on it. Jesus basically defends the woman. And eventually the people go away and they don't, they don't bother stoning her and she lives and she goes on her own way afterwards, claiming that she will live for Jesus. So Jesus, what do we see there? Jesus is a person who loves and they, those who are oppressed and those who are considered women who are considered so much more lower in that society. Jesus loves those people. We get to incidents. Then it goes on, it says Jesus, and he talks about being the light of the world. If you go on a little bit further, well, that's great because that fits well with our topic today, which says those who are in darkness free. 
He sets those who are in darkness free. Jesus is the light of the world. We just celebrated Christmas. What a great thing to celebrate when we come to Christmas, knowing that Jesus came to set people free out of darkness. And then it comes to this incident where Jesus talks about what it means to be set free. And verse 31, it says this, To the Jews who have believed him, Jesus said, me, If you hold my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We all know that verse. A lot of us might know the verse. Yeah? They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say we shall be set free? Now, you can look at it and think, and there's some commentators do, and think, how, have they forgotten something? How can they say we've never been slaves to anyone? You know, have you not forgotten what you were, the Israelites in Egypt? Have you not forgotten later on, if you go through the Old Testament, when the Assyrians took them out and each enslaved them? In fact, they put fish hooks in their mouth and dragged them out to Assyria. Have you not forgotten about the Babylonians and the Persians and the Greeks? And now you're under Roman rule. So how can you say that, they've, that you've never been through any type of slavery, that you've never been oppressed, that you've never, you're not a slave to anyone, you're not a captive to anyone. And in some way, like I say, that's where we stand today. If you, and if you're an, a non-Christian here today, or maybe you're listening online and you're questioning what it is to believe in Jesus, and you say, you know, I'm not a captive to anything. Jesus replies in 34, Jesus very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, finish it for me. You'll be free indeed. Absolutely. You'll be free indeed. And the Jews responded in a very similar way they did to Jesus at the temple. In Luke 4 that we're discussing, they basically wanted to kill him after him saying this. But the fact still remains, sometimes we can think we're not captive to anything. We're not enslaved to anything. What were these people, these, these particular people enslaved to? You know, these were religious leaders. They weren't people, if you, know, if you want to think of sin in different ways and, and what sin is. They're not people who went around and committed adultery if you like, and things like that. They're not doing the obvious sins, if you like. So what sin were their religious leaders most guilty of that Jesus really confronts them at this time? Jesus confronts him this time and says the most, the sin that they were guilty of was unbelief. And they were just refusing to accept that Jesus was who he said he was. That Jesus is the Messiah. That was their greatest sin. Or to put it another way, they may not be under some sort of slavery or oppression in terms of, <clears throat> in terms of um, different things, but... Sorry, I should get my words out. They may not be in terms of physical, I guess, slavery. But in a way, what they're most enslaved slave to was spiritual. And sometimes today, and you know, if you think of ourselves and what we're enslaved to, and there's different things that take root in our lives and our hearts. There's different things that hurt us or that make us enslaved to. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a habit. And the son says, I've come to set you free from all of this. You know, as I was thinking of it this morning, I was reminded, I was reminded that so many times we come to the Bible and we think about God in so many different ways. And I, and I wanted to touch upon this because I think it's really relevant, hopefully, for somebody here this morning. You know, that we sometimes come as Christians and, and we spiritualize things so much that we forget about every other thing in life. You know, we can either be so, we can either be focused so much on the physical or focus so much on the spiritual, but actually we don't sometimes know that God created us to be physical, emotional, and spiritual in all our ways and how we live our lives. You know, and the best way I, I can think of this, and it may be a bit of an odd choice of scripture, is, is the story of Elijah. And Elijah, he, if you, in 1 Kings chapter 19, 18 and 19, in chapter 18, there's this amazing story, and it's, it's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. And in chapter 18, God shows up in this amazing way on Mount Carmel, and he sends fire down on his sacrifice. If you want, it's a great story. I can really encourage you to read it. And his, he is full of faith at that particular time. He is full of security that God is going to answer his prayers and do what he said he would do. 
He's doing great in life. You get to chapter 19. And he, often people use this when they talk about people who, when we struggle with depression and anxiety and different things like that. But what happens in chapter 19 is the most incredible thing. He runs for his life. After being so sure and, and confident in his faith, he runs for his life. Why? Because God hadn't done what he thought he would do. God has shown up. God had done this, done, showed up. All the people had bowed down and said, you know, you are God. Your God is God. We won't follow Baal. But actually, they didn't act upon the, that afterwards. In fact, they did the exact opposite. He, he went back to Jezreel when Jezebel was there, the queen at that time. And rather than turning to him and saying, you know what, Elijah, your God is the God. which you, And he was expecting that in his heart. She wanted his life and wanted to kill him. So after that, he ran and he legged it for his life and to the point where actually said, I can't take it anymore. I wish my life would end. <coughs> after being full of faith, he came and hit rock bottom. And the response from God is such a loving and amazing response that we can take this morning for us who are struggling with captivity and with thoughts and feelings that we wish we could change. I just want to read it to you. It's good 19 verse, 19 verse 3. Elijah was afraid, so he got up and fled for his life to Bathsheba in Judah. He left his servant there. While he was on a day's journey to the desert, he went and sat down under a shrub and asked the Lord to take his life. Like we've been saying, I've had enough. Now, O oh Lord, take my life. After all, I'm no better than my ancestors. He stretched out and fell asleep under the shrub. All and then listen to this. All of a sudden, an angelic messenger touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked right there by his head, and there was a cake baking on the coals and a jug of water. He ate and drank and slept and some more. The Lord's angelic messenger came back and t again touched him and said, Get up and eat, for otherwise you won't be able to make the journey. So he got up and ate and drank. That meal gave him strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. And that is so profound. And do you know why it is so profound? It's because his faith had dwindled. His spiritual life had dwindled to the point where he wished he could take his own life. And yet you would have thought God could it'd be in his, technically be in his right to say, what are you doing? Have you not seen the great man? Have you not remembered what I literally did? However long it was, whether it was a day or so, debate. But have you not remembered what I did on Mount Carmel? How I stopped the rains, how I began the rains, how I thundered fire from heaven. Have you not remembered? What are you doing? Or he could have said, you need to get back closer to me and speak to him. And, he, and in a small voice, and his life would be back on track. But you know what he does? He first, he touches him on the shoulder. He gets a message, touches him on the shoulder. And then he feeds him. And what does that tell us? Oh, I think it's important because it tells us this. That God recognises that we have emotional and physical needs. He, sometimes when all we're going through in life is struggling and all we need is a friend or a hand on a shoulder or as we're saying to, to help the those that are oppressed, all they need is a phone call, all they need is a text. All they need is something so simple to show their affection. Then what does he do? He feeds him. He looks after him physically. Jesus, God recognises that our bodies need physical help as well. Physical nourishment. Some of us are enslaved maybe to ailments physically. And God says, I am not immune to your pain that you go through in your body or in your emotions. And then lastly... Lastly, <laughs> he helps them spiritually. If you read later on in the verse where it says, you know, the Lord's voice was not in the fire and the earthquake, but in a still, small voice. God knows us and knows that we have trouble and knows that we suffer from ailments, knows that we are captive in some ways physically, emotionally. And then spiritually. And sometimes we can be quick as Christians to jump straight to the spiritual. And that's all we focus on. Oh, if only this could be done better. If only I could read my Bible more. Yes, that's great. If only I could do this. If only I could do that. If only we could do all these different things. But then we forget about those who are suffering and actually need help physically and emotionally. 
We forget about those people who need a hand on their shoulder, a text, a message. And then also we can help out spiritually. It's not a formula. It's not saying we have to always do in one in, in the order and then we get spirituality. Sometimes we have to focus on spiritual stuff, absolutely. But it's to making the point, you know what? God focuses on every area of our lives and of our needs. So what freedom do we receive? It's been saying we've received, you could say we receive a physical freedom, an emotional freedom, and a spiritual type of freedom. Sometimes some of us, as if you're, non, if you're non-Christian here today, I want to encourage you today. <laughs> I really want to encourage you to just think about what life is like for you. And know that actually sometimes there are things going on in your life, in your heart, that you just can't get through and sometimes maybe you're at a point where you're like Elijah and you want to end it all. You're in captivity to thoughts and feelings that are just out of your control. And God wants to say, I'm not distant from you. Come to me. Get right with God. If you're a non-Christian, you say, get right with God. God wants you to know him. You may be going through other things as well. Before I want to touch on that, I just, one of the things I really wanted to, to hone in on is this. That actually, when we, when we begin to think about this, we begin to talk about freedom, being set free from captivity, being set free from all the struggles, whether it's addictions, whether it's habits, whether it's things in our lives that take root in our lives. This cheap, the, the best example we can see of this and where it's accomplished, our freedom is, is in Jesus. The author and perfect of our faith is all put on Jesus. And you know what? Where we see this, the most tangible, the most real example of our freedom being bought is at the cross. When everything, then all our wrongs, the Jesus that we do, and all our sin that separates us from God was put on Jesus. And at the cross, our freedom was bought at the highest of all prices. But you know what also happened on the cross? I've said this once, actually, in my first ever sermon here, when I first, July, uh, in the evening. And I use this example, and I think it's, it's, it's just so amazing, I think. Do you know what else happened at the cross? Our freedom was bought, absolutely. But you know what else happens when captives are set free? I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a series on Netflix called Captives, funny enough. I was watching it the other night. And when these, and there's different stories about, I don't know, maybe there's people who are being taken captive by pirates and they're being held at gunpoint for so many months, sometimes even years. And at the point where the SAS or whoever comes in and they rescue them and they get free, and the story is always focused, and quite rightly, on the captives, and then they get set free, which we can see at the cross. But then at the end of it, there's always some sort of subtitles that happen at the end. And what the subtitles usually say are what are the repercussions for those who kept them captive? What happens to those who had kept them captive all that time? And sometimes it's worth remembering that actually there's a great victory at the cross where actually the devil began to have no hold on you whatsoever. As we become to Christ and not be held by the devil's ways. You know, again, another story. I love, I love this particular one. Um, in, in, in South Korea, there was a, a, a big tank with two uh, sharks. I don't know if you remember this analogy. I've used it before. And in this analogy, there's these two great big sharks going around in this tank. And there's one of these, um, <clears throat> it's basically like a big sea life center <laughs> in South Korea. And there's, I think they're tiger sharks. And one shark is basically battering the other one constantly, absolutely going crazy all the time trying to mark his territory it's a bit like you imagine how sin acts in our lives and how the enemy works in our lives and in the world he batters and batters and batters and bruises us but there's a point where this other shark had finally said you know enough is enough i ain't going to take this no more so the other shark attacked the other shark basically swallowed him (laughs) i wish i had a picture of it and swam around the tank for three days just with the fin of the other shark left out of its mouth and eventually he said, you know, I've had enough now. I'll just regurgitate him and spit him out. So then he did, he spat him out. And everyone else, well, I'm doing a bit of a, like, you know, imagine I'm Nemo right now. But everyone else, I can imagine of those fish, were like, okay, we know who's boss. We know who, who is the boss right now. 
And in a sense, it reminds me in the Bible where it says, death was swallowed up with victory at the cross. Jesus swallowed up victory. Sin no more has a hold on us. Do we sin as Christians? Of course we do. We are not perfect. But we can come to a heavenly father who is, who is ready to forgive. So we can look to, as we go to a close, I want to sort of, before I end, end on our response. How do we respond ourselves to these things? Knowing that, yes, we have a freedom that is bought. We have an enemy who is defeated. But what do we go from here? Well, there's this great story um, that I want to tell you about a man called Rudolf Verber. I don't know if that's how you pronounce his last name. Um, it's V-R-B-A, but I'll just let you do it yourselves. And uh, basically, in a nutshell, he was, during the Second World War, he was taken captive and taken to Auschwitz. And uh, in Auschwitz, he, was, he saw all the horrific things that were happening. All the horrific pain and suffering that was going on. And this is personal to me too, because when I was younger, I, I went to visit Auschwitz and saw what it was like. And it's just the most bizarre experience I can't put it into words heart-wrenching experience and while he was there loads of escape plans were thought to get out of Auschwitz that particular time but he couldn't no one very few people ever succeeded and it came to the point in the beginning of 1944 where him and his friends decided after they heard the latest news that the, the Nazis were preparing to <coughs> the Nazis were preparing to a population of 100 million Jews. So Nazis were preparing for the arrival of Hungary's entire Jewish population of around 100 million people to be exterminated. And there was this point where he thought, you know what, I have, we have to get out because we have to warn somebody about what's happening. So him and his friends thought, thought of different ways they could escape from being captive. And eventually they got to the idea that during the day there was like a perimeter and there was an outer perimeter. And in the outer perimeter, sometimes certain prisoners were allowed to go for various reasons. And him and his friend decided what we could do is, as we've been analysing how the Nazis did this search for people, they usually did three days and then they sort of call in and then they get other people to search other elsewhere. So what they did is they got themselves together and they hid themselves in dung and grass and then they, and they sprayed it all with other different things to get rid of the sense that when people came round, they wouldn't find them. And they hid in there for three days. Three days whilst pe while people were walking by with dogs. I mean, imagine what it must be like. Wondering whether you were going to get caught. And eventually, after three days, on the last night, they both escaped and began the 11, 11 nights hike or travel to Slovakia, which was 80 miles away. And the point where they did that was that once they got to there, that they would then be able to share what was going on and that that aid would be able to come to Auschwitz. People would be aware of what was going on. Their intention was that others would be aware. And what I take from that, and what I want you to take from that this morning is this, that as we've been saying, our Christianity has to actually impact our actions. Impact the way we interact and speak to people, yes. But you know what else it must do? It must give us a hunger and a burning desire that we don't keep our Christianity to ourselves, but that we will go at great lengths to tell other people about the good news of Jesus so that they would be set free. And so often in our lives, so often in church history, the church can be a castle where it just puts up the drawbridge and then we have an evangelical crusade or if you want to call it, maybe it's one or two nights and we go out and we grab as many people as we can and we haul them back into the castle and then we lift up the door and then we keep it in and we're good for another few months. <clears throat> I'm not saying we do that here, but I'm saying to what I'm just giving in a general analogy. But sometimes we have to remember that we need to, the drawbridge always needs to be down. We need to always have this incentive passion to want to reach people with the gospel and message of Jesus because everyone are captives these days if they're not if they do not know the gospel of Jesus and the good news we must be intentional in what we do so we come to close I just invite you to sort of close your eyes for a moment and just think about what is what I've been saying this morning 
Perhaps there's somebody here or this online or in, this, in the church and you're new to the message of Christianity. And you're thinking, you know what, Jack? That touches a nerve with me. And I've got to get right with God. If that is you, then I urge you to speak to somebody this morning. Come to the front and we'll talk. We'll pray with you. Perhaps there's somebody here this morning. Perhaps this is you. That you've got to be more challenged in the way that you are intentional about your faith in serving other people. Sending a text, giving a hug, (laughs) showing emotion or support, as well as physical and spiritual. Or maybe it's you, you're here today, and you need to be more challenged to go out and give the best news to other people who don't know the message of Jesus and who desperately need to know the message of Jesus, that you would go over hot coals for someone. Because you know what? The message that we receive in, these, in Isaiah 61 is Jesus' ministry is the most profound thing because you know what? Jesus says later on in the Gospels that we are all meant to be partakers in this mission as well. So Jesus' mission is our mission. It is your mission to go out and be good news. Perhaps that is you this morning. Father, we thank you that you are present here today. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are passionate about your people, that you are passionate about your church, that you say God so loved the world that he gave his only son. A fierce, undeniable, far-reaching love that penetrates soul and spirit to reach those people, to reach this world. We thank you, Lord. That you are a God who loves each and every one of us. That you are a God of the oppressed and those who struggle. And you are their father. Would you help us in our ways, in our conduct, in our actions to reflect Jesus? Would you give that passion in our bellies to go out and be Jesus to this world? As we seek to go forward in this year as a church... Would we harness this Isaiah 61 message and take the good news to the poor, to the brokenhearted and to captives who need to be set free and see the goodness and the greatness of our God who is their loving Father. Would you give us this eagerness in Jesus' precious name? 